Uh, hello, everyone. Whatever time zone you're uh, you're in, it's morning here in the U.S. Uh, I will talk to you briefly about ASHRAE Standard 241 Control of Infectious Aerosols, which is really the cum culmination of uh, activity that ASHRAE uh, undertook related to responding to COVID starting in 2020 with the Epidemic Task Force. Uh, I chaired the Epidemic Task Force. I chair the committee that writes Standard 241, and I'm also a professor at Penn State University in the U.S. So the purpose and, and scope of the standard um, are the place to start. The, the purpose of, of uh, 241 is to establish minimum requirements for controlling infectious aerosols to reduce risk of airborne transmission. As Karen noted, it's uh, now, I think, well accepted that airborne transmission is important not only for COVID-19, but for other diseases as well. It applies to occupiable space in all types of buildings and not just to new buildings, but to renovations and additions. And uh, the focus is on outdoor air quantities and air cleaning system design, installation, commissioning, operation, and maintenance. So it's comprehensive in that respect, like other IAQ standards. Uh, what the standard does is to specify what we call equivalent clean air, which I'll uh, define for you shortly. Uh, and that requirement is to be used in infection risk management mode, which I'll <clears throat> also define. So the standard is based on controlling long range transmission, not uh, short range droplet transmission. And it's important to note that because we define this infection risk management mode, that it isn't a replacement for existing indoor air quality standards. It's an addition to them to deal with uh, a special requirement that may occur from time to time. So infection risk management mode is the name that we've given to the periods of time when the requirements of this standard might be enforced. Uh, it's an open question when that should be, and it would depend on uh, both the, the nature of the uh, epidemic or, or pandemic disease outbreak and uh, who has authority over building. So the standard doesn't say when this should be invoked, but our um, understanding, our goal is that public health officials will take part in this. Owners of buildings, especially large portfolios of buildings may make the decision. And if it's a residence, the uh, individual occupant can make that decision. The reason we shouldn't be doing that all the time is that there's a lot of concern about <clears throat> operating in this mode, potentially increasing energy use and cost, which may or may not be true, uh, but it's also true that there's a, a great variation over time in risk as uh, a lot of the endemic diseases that cause a lot of the disease burden are uh, very seasonal. So what we're describing here is a, an application of resilience to indoor air quality, just as we might do that for wildfires, which have become more of an issue in recent years. The equivalent clean airflow uh, it is defined in the standard exactly as in this first box. It's the flow rate of pathogen-free air that if distributed uniformly within the breathing zone would have the same effect on infectious aerosol concentration as the sum of actual outdoor airflow, filtered airflow, and an activation of infectious aerosol. So what we've done is to create a metric for the overall impact of all of the controls that we use so that we don't have to separately uh, try to understand the impact of outdoor air or uh, a mechanical filter or some other technology. So this is the fundamental uh, concept of the standard. We, we determine how much equivalent clean airflow for infection risk mitigation we need. And then uh, that's on a per person basis. So we can then determine how much is needed for a space and for a system and then uh, evaluate options for achieving it. <clears throat> this was adapted from uh, the concept that we called equivalent outdoor air in the epidemic task force guide. And so it's not something new. And in fact, it, uh, it's similar to concepts like clean air delivery rate that you may have seen. So the equivalent clean air flow for infection risk uh, mitigation depends on the type of space, the number of people there, and, and the activity. Uh, we've calculated uh, values of ECAI for 25 different 
uh, space types in I think it's seven different occupancy categories. And so we, we find the, the value per person, which uh, varies pretty widely. We've got as low as 10 liters per second per person, as high as uh, 45, as you can see in the table. And the, the amount that's required during infection risk management mode could be that number multiplied by the design occupancy, by full occupancy. But if that results in too high of a number, it's also at the discretion of the user to uh, consider reduced occupancy when it's necessary to provide added protection against infection risk. And the amounts in the table are increased for areas where there are high rates of focalization. <clears throat> so the target, as I noted in, in reading the definition to you, can be met with outdoor airflow, but we don't need to increase outdoor airflow above the, the minimum in our IAQ standards. Uh, it can be achieved by doing other things. So adding multi-zone or in-room air cleaning systems that may be filters removing particles or maybe technologies that inactivate uh, rather than remove. So this approach uh, allows the, the greatest possible flexibility to the user to determine solutions that are cost effective for them and that meet their other goals like energy use. There are only a few limitations on compliance. Uh, one is that you have to have the, the minimum outdoor air. So the, uh, the, the whatever standard applies locally is still in force and that will determine things like minimum filter efficiencies and minimum outdoor air. And we've also said that if we're going to um, apply the standard prescriptively, we're going to say we have a filter of a certain efficiency and therefore we're gonna take a certain amount of credit for the air recirculated through it, that that must be a MERV A11 or equivalently a, a EPM 2.5 uh, greater than 50% filter. And that's because we want the uh, filter life to, to be good and to have reliable performance at end of filter life. But because not a lot of filters are rated by the MERV A rating, which conditions the filter to take away elect electrostatic charge, uh, that's not enforced until January of 2025. Now, air cleaning in the standard refers to uh, any technology that reduces infectious aerosol concentration by capturing uh, and removal or inactivation. So it would apply to mechanical filters, including electrostatically charged media, germicidal ultraviolet disinfection, and it could be reactive species as well, ionizers, photocatalytic oxidation, and other oxidants. But it's important to note that while you could use these technologies, the standard does not list or endorse specific technologies and it doesn't rank them. So the, the fact that a technology could be permitted does not mean that it's recommended or endorsed. So what did we do? Instead of trying to, to vet different technologies, what we did was to try to establish a uh, so-called level playing field on which they could be evaluated. The two things that are important for an air cleaning technology are how effective is it and is it safe? So um, that was our goal in writing the standard was to develop the best criteria for effectiveness and safety that we possibly could. Um, because although we have a lot of effective technologies, we know that some of them through photochemistry and other means produce byproducts, including ozone and particles and, and uh, VOCs. <clears throat> so standard 241, uh, references existing standards for testing for effectiveness and safety, and also because the, the landscape of standards for this kind of testing is rather incomplete as of today, uh, we also wrote uh, a significant normative appendix that provides test procedures for technologies for which none exist outside of the standard. So the uh, uh, application of standard 241 results in the development of what we call a building readiness plan. So this is uh, a documentation that should stay with the systems and the building that describes uh, all of the controls that have been selected to operate in infection risk management mode and how they're to be used. So this summarizes an exercise. It starts with assessment of a facility, whether it's uh, new or existing, 
and the planning to determine uh, what uh, additional uh, equivalent clean air needs to be provided, if any, and how that's going to be done. And then it's to be uh, implemented and, and kept up to date. And this is a direct uh, descendant of, of a document also called the Building, this Ready Building Readiness Plan that was developed by the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force several years ago. So I've covered uh, at a high level the main requirements of the standard. A, a lot of it uh, in, in the second part deals with how you apply those requirements. So there are, are sections on assessment planning and implementation and the building readiness plan is really the end point of that, um, that exercise. That we're applying the, the principles of commissioning and retro commissioning to uh, a specific infection risk mitigation objective. Uh, the development of plants optional for dwellings, the, the homeowner does not have to have one, but uh, we uh, believe this should be a requirement for other types of, of facilities that are covered. Now, the, the beginning of, of this process of assessment after determining the condition of all the equipment is to determine how much equivalent clean air uh, the system provides. And, and once that's done, you can calculate the target equivalent clean air that's required. And if there's a difference, then go through the exercise of um, figuring out how to achieve it. We've provided a lot of uh, supporting information to help the user do this. There's a, an appendix for doing um, in-place testing of uh, the, the uh, particle removal performance of systems using uh, tracer particles. There are checklists for the assessment and commissioning process. There's a template for the building readiness plan. And there's a spreadsheet calculator that's also descended from an epidemic task force tool that will allow you to calculate at least space by space uh, equivalent clean air provided by different options. And we um, are working on one that is multiple space. And there's also some guidance on energy recovery ventilators and uh, preventing reentrainment of contaminated air. There's a section on operations that deals with uh, really two things from my point of view. One is, is things that should be uh, in place for IRMM and also how you operate the system. So the building readiness plan should be on site, accessible, current, uh, supply should be stocked, operators should be trained, occupants should know what they have to do with anything. And then all of the operating mode should be programmed. Uh, as far as operational matters, we uh, don't require or recommend any changes in temperature and humidity set points. Uh, systems need to be on for all occupied hours, no on off fan operation because that would cause big variations in equivalent clean air. And because we have a high level of equivalent clean air flow provided at all times, flushing between occupancy periods is not deemed to be necessary. There are maintenance requirements in the standard and uh, these are modeled after ASHRAE standard 62.1, which has 31 different maintenance items. The main thing that we've done in 241 is to increase the frequency of some of these things like checking whether the outdoor airflow being provided is actually what was designed in the system. And there are also some requirements for uh, air cleaners. So to, uh, to summarize briefly, this is the whole process of applying the standard. I've covered the requirements. But the process itself, I think, is in eight steps. You assess the facility to determine uh, its condition and, and what equivalent clean air is being provided. Uh, determine the target for the, the space or system. And then uh, if there is a, a positive difference between those two, then determine how to provide the, uh, the additional amount of equivalent clean air that's required. Prepare the building readiness plan and then implement it, perform repair and maintenance as needed, make upgrades if they're needed, and then operate the system in IRMM when needed. So that's been uh, very quick, and it still, I think, took me more than 12 minutes, but uh, pretty close. So uh, thank you, that's all I have, and I look forward to questions, and I'll pass it on to uh, Yara Kurnitsky now from um, uh, Riva to talk about uh, European standards. Thank you.